parts of the video may be used by the club in its public relations and social media outreach. We can make exceptions for those that don't want to be recorded. Uh, contact David Carr. He's one of the edits and posts our videos, I believe. And we typically share the video within our Facebook group uh, for member educational purposes. The purpose of this club is for members to learn better skills for webinars and online events. I want to remind everybody to use headsets or earbuds unless you've got a separate noise canceling microphone on your desktop. Uh, mute your mic whenever it's not your turn or you're not speaking so we don't pick up background noise for other speakers and you can also toggle your video on and off. It's good to toggle your video off when you might be doing something that could be distracting to other people doing something you don't want people to see you doing. Uh, there are two different views you have. You can have a speaker view or a gallery view. The controls for that are usually in the upper right hand corner of your screen. And you can click on either one and toggle back and forth. So please watch the timer. Roger's our timer tonight. Uh, be aware who the timer is. It's also a good idea to use your own timing device in case you can't find Roger's image on the screen. So timers are encouraged to use some kind of an audible sound along with the timing light, so it helps. Uh, Roger, are you going to use an audible sound tonight too or just the, the visuals? Okay. <laughs> That's the example. Good. Thank you. Okay. If you're interested in joining, we have a, uh, on our website, we have a pull down menu. If you want to join and fill out the information and that goes to our club officers and we'll process your request and get in touch with you. We do, we do require a general requirement of at least completing six Toastmaster speeches and, uh, and we can make exceptions for people who have speaking experience outside of Toastmasters. So let's get the meeting started. It's showtime. And I'm going to, let's see. Monica, I'm gonna make you the host, is that okay? Sure. Okay, go ahead. I'd like to introduce Monica now tonight. She's our test master of the evening. And take it away, Monica. All right. Today our theme is Labor Day. I always thought this was just an extra day off work for the United States anyway. What I learned when I went and looked up what Labor Day actually was and what it actually, how it came about. I found out that Oregon was one of the first states to implement Labor Day, and that was back in 1887. Our entire government didn't initiate it until June of 1884. Since then, we've always had the first Monday of September off. And this was to celebrate the labor movement and the milestones that they made through the labor uh, uh, unions and how they actually helped us. While I was researching it, I also found out that other countries have similar type thing called May Day. They celebrate it in May. So it was very interesting for me to be the Toastmaster today and get to share that with you. I also have other people that would be helping me tonight and I would like for Roger to explain his duties now as timer. Thank you, Madam Toastmaster. I am playing two roles today. First of all, I'm the timer. We have two speeches today. The first one from Norman is going to be four to six minutes. The second is David, five to seven. I'll be using the flag that I've shown earlier with the color flag and also the audible ding if need be. Also, I will be the vote counter. Therefore, when it's time to vote, go ahead and send it through chat privately to Roger, the timer and vote counter. 
Back to you, Madam Toastmaster. Thank you, Roger. I also have a grammarian that will be helping. And Angela, could you explain your duties as well as your word of the day? You're still on mute, Angela. <laughs> it's okay, unmute. Yeah, that's funny. Okay, let me do one thing. Because I can't remember it, you know, on my own, I need help, so. One thing, there we go. Okay, here we go. Thank you, Madam Toastmaster. So fellow Toastmasters, friends and guests, my role as a grammarian is to pay attention to the proper use of English and provide constructive feedback for improvements. At the end of the meeting, I will give you my report. Before that, I'd like to introduce the word of the day, which is diligence. In honor of Labor Day, diligence is a noun. It means the constant and earnest effort to accomplish a task. So for this meeting, um, I want to encourage you all to use diligence if, whenever you can, and I will be recording that um, as frequently as you can. I will be counting, and I will report back again at the end of the meeting. Back to you, Madam Toastmaster. Thank, Thank you, you, Angela. Thank you. For our watcher tonight, that will be Jim Barber, who agreed to do this for us. Jim, explain your duties, please. With pleasure, Madam Toastmaster. As the watcher this evening, this is kind of tough. Follow me on this. I'm going to be watching. Now, this is something that would be illegal in 47 states around the country, but at online presenters, it's not only legal, but it is encouraged. I will be watching everybody's video presence, basically, and seeing that everybody is representing themselves adequately, visually, and I'll report at the end of the meeting. That's it. Madam Toastmaster. Thank you, Jim. Uh, last, but by no means least, our chat monitor, Jim Dent. Could you explain your duties, please? Sure, I'll be watching the chat window, um, looking to see what, what we're chatting about, anything consistent, how interesting the chat is, just to give you an idea, and the club I, the online club I attended on Saturday, which I told you about the timer app, I was surprised there was only a total of five chats in an hour meeting in that club. They're not very chatty, but uh, we've already exceeded that already just in this short uh, 10 minutes that we've been in. So uh, we're far ahead of them. So I'll be watching the chat and reporting on this at the end of the meeting. Thanks, Jimmy. We'll get into our speeches for tonight, our first speaker. It. Yes, she has. I think David has also told her that we shuffled some stuff around, so she gets to enjoy tonight. <laughs> Norman Dow's speech is from Visionary Communications Level 1, Mastering Fundamentals Icebreaker. In, as anyone who has listened to him speak over the last year knows, Norman Dow has a deep interest in black history and culture. Although he is a black man, that interest was not part of his childhood. This speech reintroduces Norman to online presenters and explains how he has developed this interest. Please join me in welcoming Norman. Good evening, fellow online presenters. Coming out of a predominantly white community as a young black guy, I was really shocked by the encounter with a black institution it was cultural shock. I chose to go to an HBCU, Hampton University. Now, it's an excellent college, and I would lie to you if I told you I went there because it was excellent. My parents were Hamptonians, and they took me to the coronation of Miss Hampton and her party. And I saw the most beautiful scenery I'd ever seen in my life, more beautiful black women than ever. And I said, where do I sign? I refuse to submit another application. I was a Hamptonian. <laughs> but once I was there, I learned a, a number of, of lessons that have stayed with me. 
First of all, I jumped right in and joined the college or the chapel choir. And in the chapel, which is this iconic structure on our campus, there is a rotunda around and they're alternating heads, brick heads, Negroid and Native American. I'm sitting in the choir loft looking and that's kind of odd. First of all, brick sculpture. I've never seen brick sculpture. Historically, it had, there had been a vocational school and they made their own brick. So they decided to memorialize some of the history of Hampton. But Native American and Negroid heads, it seemed like our beautiful country that was wondering, could Native Americans learn? So they sent them to Hampton to figure out, could they learn? So we have a history of Sioux and Native American and African Americans there. I began to question some of the stuff that I had been told. My speech teacher said, do you believe what you read? I said, not everything. How about the Britannica? Well, it's great. He took me and said, read the 1946 edition of the end, the end edition, when it described Negroes almost like apes. I began to question everything. <laughs> I learned to question. I learned about diversity. We were all or virtually all black. We were about 95% black, but there's a lot of difference between South Central and rural Virginia and Africa and Harlem and the town I grew up in. I, knew, I learned that there was diversity even among people that were basically the same color. And also I learned a, a, a pattern of black excellence to strive. It was a very, very difficult academic environment. We didn't know about grade inflation. I wish they had. I had this second highest GPA as a math um, uh, uh, in the math department. Oh, excuse me. The second, the highest GPA in the math department my senior year was 3.14. <laughs> that was it. That was the highest. Everything else went down. <laughs> okay. My, my, my next uh, encounter was a few years later. I stumbled into an urban black church in Washington, D.C. It was a really a different place. I was Presbyterian as a child, you know, where the benediction comes up an hour after the service starts. We had a two and a half hour service and it was fun. It was really fun. It shocked me. I didn't understand that church could be fun if something was going on, but there was all these weird things happening. Presbyterians don't touch. These people hugged. And I, I always remember we went, our choir had to sing someplace and there was a welcome address and response to welcome. And I was like, what is all of this? A number of traditions, my first reaction was the tradition is, is bad, it's wrong. Then it's interesting. And then, wow, maybe we can learn something. For instance, the Bla Black Baptist Church apprentices members to be ministers when they choose to be a minister doesn't send them away to school to learn. When I told my pastor that I thought God had called me to preach, he said, fine, we prayed, for, we prayed. He scheduled a sermon. You think an icebreaker is something? I got up in front of a congregation. I gave a sermon with no preparation. And then he asked the, for a vote to be taken by the deacon board right then. Do you believe this guy was called to preach? And it could go up or down. It, thank God it went up and I was apprenticed to the pastor to learn the craft of ministering. I was encouraged to go to school, but I primarily was apprenticed to him in that process. That was very different. Is that good? Well, I think it's actually good. It's, it, it's better than being sent away. I began to be intrigued by the differences that I saw within the black culture. And as I went, I began to understand that there is something that perhaps we could even learn, uh, the major culture can learn from what's going on 
in the black culture, often off the screen, out of view. Something that is also very positive. I have learned to love black. Thank you, Madam Toastmaster. Thank you, Norman, for sharing with us. Our next speaker is David Carr. David's speech is at a Dynamic Leadership Level 1 Mastering Fundamentals Evaluation and Feedback. This is his first speech. David Carr recently joined the Enterprise Software Support Company, Remini Street, as Editorial Director. On Wednesday, he will be delivering a briefing about editorial initiatives to new hires in the Remini Street Marketing Department. For this practice session, he will be turning off his webcam to simulate giving an online slide presentation in an environment without video. Please join me in welcoming David. Thank you for that introduction. It, it's, it's great to have a chance to be here and to help tell the story of my piece of our corporate marketing organization. Now, of course, I think most of you are gathered together in a, a conference room someplace out in Pleasanton, and I'm on the other side of the country in Florida. So I, I apologize for being a talking head coming out of the, the phone, but I'm gonna try and introduce myself as well as I can, and hopefully we'll have a chance to meet real soon. I'll be out to visit around the middle of the month. And just so you, if, if you do see me in the hallway, that's more or less what I look like. I photoshopped the background. The background was originally yellow. Uh, so I had to, the, the idea was to have a head in the clouds as in cloud computing. So I'm supposed to be somebody who tells the story of technology. I'm collaborating with executives at Ramini Street to help tell the story of what we do in the technology market, how we do it, why it's special, what makes it exceptional, and how we can continue to do it more effectively. I've also gotten drafted to doing some editing for landing pages and other content. But I'm really a storyteller. I'm coming out, out of a background as a journalist. So I'd been a technology journalist for a number of years. I was an editor at large at Information Week, where I had a number of different focuses on social media computing, the impact of social media on business computing, healthcare IT at various times, and government IT. I was a technology editor at Baseline Magazine, which was a competitor, CIO Magazine, and a senior technology at Internet Worlds, and that's going back to the mid-90s when the web was just starting to become a thing. And I'm the author of a book, Social Collaboration for Dummies. So what am I doing at Ramini Street, though? I'm, I'm helping to lead a team that works on producing content that is in support of our sales effort, in support of our evangelism of the company in a number of different ways. And I'm telling you about it largely so that, that you can come to me with your ideas or your feedback on what we ought to be doing better, stories that we ought to be telling. I have built up a small stable of writers. A number of these are professional contacts of mine uh, the first four on the list all wrote at some point for Information Week. John Barnes is actually a pretty experienced uh, science fiction writer. He co-authored a book with Buzz Aldrin, and I used to have him do technology slideshows about space technology for Information Week. Even though that didn't have that much to do with IT, it was great eye candy for nerds. It brought people in, they clicked through the slideshows, and everybody was happy. Uh, Alice Booker, Kristen Burnham, Kevin Casey, all wrote for Information Week at different points. Alice and I actually go back to Internet World, again, back when the web was young. And Mary Carlton is coming out of more the copywriting world. And this, these are not all our resources. We also have an agency that we hired recently. We have a number of experienced people that we can come in, call in to help tell the story. So again, I'm somebody who's gonna deal primarily 
with the words, the written word, writing, editing, but there are other ways of telling stories too with video, and I'm, I'm interested in all of that, but I'm primarily a writer and editor personally. I want to show you a little bit of background of some of the stories that we're telling. We're trying to organize them along some consistent themes. The cost and value of support. You're paying too much to SAP. You're paying too much to Oracle for the quality of what they're giving you. And we can help you improve those economics and free up money that you can do more innovative work with. Use your technology to make yourselves a more dynamic company. Support for success is kind of the, the more positive aspect where we're emphasizing the excellence, the experience of the people we have. And we're looking for ways of dramatizing how good they are <laughs> and why they make our customers more successful. Risk is an issue. A lot of people think it's risky to step away from that enterprise software company support that they get by default. Uh, we want to show them that, that actually it's riskier to stay where they are. And the cloud is a huge issue. I, I talked about my focus on cloud computing and that's the sexy stuff. But when you do it, we want you to do it the right way. One that actually creates more freedom for your company, allows you to innovate, as opposed to a cloud architecture that's dictated by a vendor that only makes you more deeply locked into their technology. And then we, we, have, we tell some broader stories about CIOs being change agents within their organizations, using technology to make positive difference for the company. And then we have product specific things about uh, specific things that we're doing. For, for example, with Salesforce, Dreamforce conference coming up in a couple of weeks, we'll be talking about how we're not just supporting the technology that you've had around since the 80s, we're supporting some of this new stuff that has come about in the, the last couple of de decades that is cloud oriented, that is innovative, and Salesforce supports their people takes them out of the business of having to run servers and network switches, but there's still a lot of additional support we can provide beyond what Salesforce itself does. So these are some of the common stories we're telling. We're trying to guide them through a process where we take them from the raw idea to a more developed idea with a title and an abstract to being assigned and then to being finalized and going through rounds of approval and one of the joys of working at Romini Street is we get to go through an extra round of approval with the lawyers before we can publish anything. But eventually we get things out, we get them published. And what I wanna know from you is really, how can we take the story and tell it more effectively? I'm looking for your ideas, your feedback. I want you to think of me as a resource to help you tell the story more effectively as well. Back to you. Thank you, David. Now, before we move on to the next portion, I'll get the timer to give us the times for the two speakers. That way you can, okay, he's posted them in the chat. Norman had 615 and David had 720. So we can vote now on best speaker. You can send those votes in the chat box to Roger. So just select Roger's name in the drop down and send him the votes. Now we'll move on to the next portion, which is table topics. And Carol Prohensky, the newest international director, will be our table topics master for the night. Carol? Well, thank you, Monica. I am one of seven new international directors, and it's a pleasure um, to step forward into that role. It's a pleasure to be table topics master tonight. So our first table topic speaker will be Scott Johnson. Scott, listen closely. When you were being raised in your family, your family of origin had an attitude of either pro-union or anti-union. What was it and what was your take on that? You are on mute, Scott. Very good. 
Thank you very much, Madam Table Topics Master. Well, coming from Australia, um, we weren't really very much uh, unionised. So uh, in Australia, we have, um, you may be aware, we have Labor and Liberal. Liberal seems to be um, a lot of the opposite to the union. So we weren't very human, um, didn't have much uh, union say as such. So um, living, and I, and I was born in a country town, so uh, that was even worse. I think if I was born in a, a bigger town, in, in one of the main towns of Australia, Melbourne or Sydney or Canberra, it could have been quite different. But uh, I was born in a, a town which is probably four hours west of Sydney um, to a place called Dubbo, and there was very laid back, very rural, and uh, there wasn't much um, unionisation in in that town itself. But um, I, I did uh, I did enjoy growing up, and uh, it's always interesting to learn about um, the two different. And since I've moved closer to Sydney, living on the Central Coast, which is not far, uh, we uh, we're more subject to um, to unionisation, and even in my working life. It wasn't. Uh, it wasn't really that unionised. Um, some of the other business um, businesses in Australia, like uh, the shipping business or or other areas of uh, of business in Australia, are very much unionised. But for me, I didn't. I didn't really have that much union, uh, unionisation. And also, to answer your question, then uh, non non union. So uh, that's 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 my take on unionisation. Thank you so much, Scott. Sonny, you're next. Sonny, the largest union currently in the United States, your location of choice, happens to be the National Education Association of the United States. It has 2.7 million members. Why do you think unions are needed in education? Sonny, you're up. Thank you, Madam Toastmasters. The National Education Association probably is one of the big unions. I don't know as much about that, but as an educator, I can tell you that you always want support. Growing up as a little girl, my mom was an educator. She was a teacher. And I do remember that she was a member of the United Federations of Teachers. And it was always important. They were always fighting for more equal pay or better working conditions. So I realized at a young age that unions had a role. Then as I became a professional, I also recall that they had an organization for people who were in front of the camera. And I always wanted to join so I could be a member of AFTRA. I don't even remember what it stands for now, but I know that it represented people in front of the camera, whether they were actors or anchors or, or, or news people, but I really enjoyed it. And also my dad was a member of Postal Union. So unions can help you look for the union label. I remember that as advertisement. So I think that unions have a place in society to help teamwork makes the dream work. And sometimes you need a voice behind you. Thank you, Madam Table Topics Master. Back to you. Thank you, Sunny. Jane, as our guest, are you interested in participating tonight? You can say no. Um, yeah, of course, I'd love to join. Okay, fantastic. All right, Jane, as, as, a, as a guest member, we'd like to learn a little bit more about you, particularly as it rate, relates to unions. Have you ever been in a union? And if yes, could you tell us more? If you have not been in a union, what's your general take on unions? Are they a good thing or not for our communities? Um, okay, well, thank you for that question. I have, I have been part of a union apparently, but I was too young and way too naive to appreciate its benefits. In fact, I really messed up. Uh, I, used, I worked for World Cost Plus. It, you, you, does anybody know World Cost Plus? There's one in San Francisco and they sell a bunch of things like furniture and Marmite, Vegemite. And um, 
and they kind of hired me on the spot. They told me I would pay extra a month and they would go to a union. And I said, okay, well, at least I got the job. And um, I, I just didn't like working there. That's it. Um, and then later on, um, I learned from my husband. My husband, he is his father. He was a mailman for, like a lot, for many, many years. Like, I don't know, 25 years maybe. And, um, and he has many good things to say about it. So... I, I think it's a, I think it's a good thing. I I just don't have many experiences with labor because I've been fired from too many jobs in my lifetime. <laughs> so I don't know what it's like to really work in the United States. I just work for myself. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. And we're going to wish you well on having a job for longer than a, a few short months. All right. Okay. Oh my goodness. Um, Adrian, Adrian, I'm going to ask you a similar question. So have you been a member of a union and what's your take on it? If you haven't been a member of a union, what's your take on it? Adrian? I have not been a member of a union. I think unions are great because people are we love to take control of other people. And if you don't have a union to fight for the rights of other people, it would just always be chaos. People would never get raises. The same people would always be in office. You would never have people retire from their positions. There would be just no rights for the people. They would work so many hours. They wouldn't get vacation time. They wouldn't have the health benefits they need to have. Someone has to speak up. The most common thing I see in the media talked about with unions is with the airlines. The pilots make a lot of money already. They make like 275000 a year, but that doesn't stop them from having the union say they need more things. And I'm thinking, really? They make a lot of money, but they still want more rights. And what do they do? They stop coming to work. They show up. They fight for more rights, more benefits, more time off. I don't know if they do too many flights for too many hours back to back at one time, whatever it is, they call their union, the union spokespeople come and they say, listen, our pilots aren't getting enough rest. They don't have enough time to be with their families, have drinks before the next flight. They fight for their rights so they have equal opportunity to drinking like the rest of us. <laughs> Not six hours before I have to show to work. The rest of us, we drink and we may show up to work four hours later and we're fine. So you need the union to fight and represent your rights just for that. If nothing else, then drinking. Mrs. Table Topics Master. Well, thank you, Adrian. I think she was just talking about drinking and flying. Was that, did I get that right? No, no. Yes, I did. Oh, no. <laughs> Adrian, we got to talk. All right. Um, looking at the clock, I, I have time for more. Um, anybody want to volunteer? Okay, Stacy, you're up, and Angela, then you'll be next. Um, Stacy, I want you to come out anti-union for a moment. I want you to put that hat on. Are you pro-union? Um, well, I've never been a part of a union, so it's <laughs> okay. All right, I want you to be anti-union for a minute. I want you to talk about three good reasons why we should not have unions out there. Oh man. <laughs> Thanks, Stacy. <Right. laughs> well, I, I'm laughing because I, I work for airline <laughs> and it's eight hours. <laughs> so so the crew members should have a right to drink and wait eight hours <laughs> before they go to work. <laughs> um well it's kind of interesting because uh we were, well, a man, a gentleman that was retiring was trying to get a union for our department uh, before, that was like his last hurrah and it didn't happen and literally people are being let go right now, you know, because they're, they're transitioning and moving and the only department that uh, that's moving is the one that's union. <laughs> so, but I would say that to pro, uh, okay, against union. Well, if as a supervisor, I guess if you come from the perspective of the supervisor, um, you know, by not forming, by your employees not forming a union, um, it gives you um, 
you know, the right, you don't have so many complications. You don't have to, if you give um, instructions to an employee, you don't have to go um, to that, that union rep, that union rep becomes that middleman. So it cuts out that in middleman. <laughs> It cuts out the middleman um, between the rep, the, between the manager and the employee. Um, there's certain rules and regulations, like you know, uh, I know for my job we work 12-hour shifts. Um, I, if we were unionized, we'd probably fight to work eight or 10 hours. Um, so by not being in a union, um, the requirement is th is 12 hours on, 12 hours off. Um, by not having a union, uh, we can't fight, you know, for our, we can't fight to have um, meals if we're not, if we're disgruntled or unhappy. Uh, usually pilots get $50 for a meal. <laughs> All right. Thank you Stacy. Angela, because right. Because you are in charge of the word of the day, we're going to talk about diligence. Okay. As it relates to unions. Okay. Right now, some have argued that union labor is not diligent, that they're, they're sloughing off on the job and drinking heavily in their spare time. Um, and we certainly wouldn't want that to impede our productivity. Um, I'd like you to speak specifically regarding the diligence of unionized employees. Angela. Thank you, Madam Table Topics Minister. Um, okay, as far as the diligence of employees and the unions. Well, I personally don't have a lot of experience as far as belonging to a union. I've worked in business a long time. However, my father worked on the railroad for 30 years. He worked seven days a week as much as possible and say, I would say 10 to 16 hours a day as much as possible. And he was, he had a serious injury twice. And so I feel like in those types of situations where there is a lot of danger, the unions have been very helpful with helping people keep their jobs because he had worries of losing his job regardless of the fact that he was a very diligent worker and he was willing to work you know, every day is birthday, Christmas, every day. So I feel like in certain cases, unions are very um, appropriate and, um, you know, employee-centric, which is wonderful. But it's like everything else. You know, we have this thing called standard deviation, which I think applies in virtually everything. So you see most of the people fit into this norm near the top of the near the top of the graph, and most of us are working diligently and fitting all the rules and solving problems and being supportive of each other, but there's always other people on the left or right side of the standard deviation that are misusing unions or taking advantage of unions or whatever. But for the general population, they're great. They're very helpful and they support the, the worker. Thank you, Madam Table Topics Minister. Thank you, Angela. These are my peeps, man. I am so in the right place. I'm standard deviation, I'm drinking and flying. I mean, like, I so belong in this group. All right, so we need to select the best table topic speaker amongst these amazing table spot topic speakers. First, we had Scott talking about his raising in a family of liberals, anti-union. Then we had Sonny talking about the uh, UFT. I don't remember now what that stood for, Sonny, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Jane talked about her many jobs. Adrian talked about airlines and drinking. Stacy talked about anti-union 12-hour shifts and the middleman cut. Angela talked about her dad on the railroad, 30 years of diligent hard labor. All speakers are within time. All qualify for voting. Please vote for the best table topic speaker and send it privately in a private chat to Roger. All attendees are welcome to vote, visitors and non-visitors. 
All right. And back to our Toastmaster, Monica. Woo! Monica. Thank you, Carol. Very interesting. I don't know that I want to be on the flight where the pilots have been drinking. I might pass that flight over, but it was very interesting what everybody had to say. And to stay diligent with my role, I want to move on to our evaluation portion. Our general evaluator tonight is Sunny. I will turn it over to you so you can conduct the evaluations for tonight. Thank you, Madam Toastmaster of the day. Now that I know that I am conducting the rest of the portion of this meeting, I am happy to do so. Next up, this is the part where we get to listen to the evaluators who will be giving feedback to our speakers. Our first evaluator is Lois Margolin. She will be evaluating Norman Dow's speech. Lois? We, that's the change we made early, Sunny. It'll be Scott. Scott will be doing the evaluation for Norman. Okay, Scott will be doing the evaluation for Norman. Thank you, Toastmaster, Madam Toastmaster. I thought it was Adrian. <laughs> okay. I, and I, I, I thought we'd change that in the start to Adrian, because Adrian said she was doing it. Is that correct or not? They gave it to you because they said I already had another role. Uh, okay. Well, I can, I, can give, I can give an evaluation, because I can remember it pretty well. I, okay. um, thank you, um, Madam Toastmaster. I really, enjoyed, I really enjoyed Norman's speech. And one thing I really like about Norman's is he, he shows the emotion on his face. He's very emotional. And for me itself, he, it's very structured. And I really liked his hand gestures because you could actually see his hands up here and not below. So uh, I think Norman had, um, had a very powerful start. He had a good structure. He spoke very clearly. And he achieved his... He reintroduced himself to online presenters. So he, he told us all about um, the, the black man and, and his plight through different circumstances. So I really enjoyed Norman. And for, a, for an Australian, I really enjoy just hearing the plights of the American people, and especially the, the black people. Uh, it's, it's very exciting. Um, I could see that he had some eye contact. He was moving back and forward. He was, um, he had, really, really clear and audible voice so everybody could understand exactly what he had to say. Um, well structured. Um, I just really, I really enjoyed the speech, Norman. Um, sorry, I can't give more because of the mix up, but um, I, I thought it was well structured. You had good vocal variety. You could see you were looking, you had good hand gestures. Um, I really can't offer you any points for improvement. I'm sorry, Norman, because um, I was a bit confused that it was me, but um, I really enjoyed it, Norman. Um, I look forward to your next one. And as an icebreaker, I learned heaps and heaps about um, about Norman Dowd and uh, that what the objectives were to uh, to reintroduce yourself. And uh, I thank you for that. Back to you, Madam Toastmaster. And I'll take it back here. Thank you, Scott, for that evaluation of Norman Dow. Next, we will have an evaluation of David Carr. Our evaluator will be Jim Barber. Thank you, Madam General Evaluator. I was having trouble unmuting myself. Madam General Evaluator, my fellow Toastmasters, our guest Jane, and especially Toastmaster David Carr. Wow, David, this was a different presentation and so this is going to be a bit of a different evaluation. For one thing you had no live video. This was slide display only and that makes it difficult for me to evaluate your body language. I think your body language was good but I'm gonna have to kind of take your word on that one. The thing that I really liked about it is this was real world. This is something, this is a presentation that you're going to be giving uh, in the real world and so this is this is beyond theory. This is no ivory tower. This is something real. You're going to be presenting this to new hires at uh, Rimini Street. In terms of your presentation, 
it's no surprise everything was great. Your, your presentation, your content was well written, it was well structured, the timing was great, your delivery was top notch all across the board. I don't think you need me to pump you up on, on what you did well, so I'm just gonna cut to the chase and give you a couple of suggestions on things that I think you could make it a little bit stronger. Uh, Towards the beginning of your presentation, you referred to the five people on your staff as a small staff. I, I think it's a matter of perspective, but I don't think five people, especially the five that you listed there, uh, counts as a small staff. I think that's a very quality, uh, great, uh, great staff right there. And I'm not sure that a small staff is the word, the, the feeling that you wanted to go for. Uh, small point. The next to last slide, your slides were great, but the next to last slide had too many words on it. You wanna show us pictures of things, not pictures of words. So I would suggest breaking that slide up into several different slides because you had it up there for quite a while, uh, quite a amount of time. And while you're doing it, ooh, uh, while you're, thank you, uh, while you're doing it, the, uh, a display, as I say, display pictures of things rather than, than the actual words. The last thing that I had, I indicated, I jotted a note at the beginning of your speech that I would like you to focus more on, especially since these are new hires, what you're doing for them or what you expect from them, what they can do for you. You closed with that. You're telling them what you could do, what they could do for you. I would like for you to have seen you reference that earlier in your presentation. I think it would have allowed you to establish a better rapport with new hires that are maybe trying to kind of feel their way, feel important in the organization and that sort of thing. But these are small things that uh, will just simply be tweaks to a great presentation. This is going to be very good and can, good luck with it. Madam General Evaluator. Thank you, Toastmaster Jim Barber. At this time, we are going to now vote for the best speaker. Mr. Timer, did both speakers qualify? And you are giving us the thumbs up. So everyone, would you please sing your votes to Roger, our timer and vote counter on whether Jim, I'm sorry, whether David Carr, well, Norman was speaker number one and David Carr was speaker number two. Moving on, we are now going to find out how we did overall in terms of our words and did we make it on time. First, I would like to call on the grammarian, Miss Grammarian of the day. Is that Angela? Yes, yes, thank, thank you. So Angela Smucker, will you please give us your report? Okay. Um, I, um, everybody, it seems like, did an excellent job of presenting their topics. And um, I would say Norman did a great job of, you know, he, it was more of a conversation, and I loved it. Um, he was sharing with us his experiences. It was more spontaneous, of, you know, while he's thinking of the things that he experienced. And I loved it. I caught him one time saying stuff. But for me, that kind of conversation is going to have more casual language. It was great. Um, as far as David's, it was great. I didn't, nobody, I didn't hear anybody, either one of them use diligence. But David's was great, very professional, business-like, formal language, very nice. And um, I did count Carol used diligence, I think, seven times, which I appreciate that. And Monica once, I think, maybe twice. So thank you, Madam Evaluator. Thank you, Angela, for that grammarian report. Now we move on to the watcher of the day. That's me, that Madam Toastmaster. <laughs> Let's see, as watcher this evening, first of all, Lois. Lois vanished, didn't she? Wherever Lois went, she had a great tropical background. That looked so nice. It looked like she was outdoors. I really liked that. Most people went for the simple background, and that looks very nice. Uh, let's see, I noted uh, Roger, Monica, Angela, Scott, Stacy, and especially Norman with his solid black background. Very striking. I like that. 
Speaking of Norman, though, and you're doing it right now, Norman, when you relax, relaxing is great, but you're almost relaxing off screen. There you go. That's it. Uh, other than that, everybody did a great job. It was fun being, a, being your watcher this evening. Back to you, Madam Toastmaster. Now I'm watching you, Jim Barber, <laughs> watching you. Next up, we have our eye counter of the day. I counter of the day, will you please give us your report? Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. I'm Madam General Evaluator. Um, Angela, I had two aunt. Can you hear me? Angela, two ands, over five ums, French words, well, okay, safe. David Carr, uh, two ums, a so, French words, stuff. Again, Sonny, crutch words, soul. Scott Johnson, over 10 ums. Monica, Toastmaster of the Day, over one um, one soul. Jane, over five ums, one soul. Norman, over four ums. Jim Barber, over one um. Stacy, over 10 ums, crutch word, but thank you so much for letting, giving me the opportunity to be your our counter for today. Back to you, Madam General Evaluator. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian, for your report on Oz. You today were our wizard of Oz. <laughs> now we move on to the chat monitor. Chat monitor of the day, will you please give us your report? I will. Chat was Thank quite you, Mr. President. Busy. Thank you, Jim. The chat was quite busy today. I want to congratulate everybody. There was a lot of comments about role confirmations, whereas we were switching roles at the very beginning of the meeting. There was a lot of comments on both Norman's speech and David's speech. Good comments, um, suggestions, but also just congratulations and what they liked. There was also one comment about Stacy's laugh. That was happened during Norman's speech. She was very expressive in how she laughed. So somebody made a comment about that. And there were several reminders and confirmations of speech times that were planned for the icebreaker and for David's speech. And of course, what's really good is we posted the times of the different roles so that people could vote and know who was qualified and who wasn't. Very good chat tonight. Back to you. Thank you, Jim Dan, Mr. President, for your chat monitor report. Mr. Timer, do you get another opportunity to give us your report? Yes, uh, thank you, Wonderful. Madam General Evaluator. I will give two reports. First, as the timer, today everybody did very well in terms of using their time as much as they can instead of just trying to sneak in and drop out. So kudos to everybody to fully use purposefully the time that you have. Number two, it will be my report as the vote counter. The best speaker for tonight is Norman. Our best table topic speaker is Sonny. And our best evaluator tonight is Jim Barber. Congratulations to all and back to you, Madam General Evaluator. Thank you, Mr. Timer, for that report. Now I will give my general evaluation. Would that be correct, Madam Toastmaster of the Day? Shaking your head, thank you very much. Yes. Over, overall, time management wise, we started on time and because we only had two speakers, we're going to end on time more than likely. The theme, we had a Labor Day theme, how apropos, and we had very nice explanation by Monica. Table topics, excellent labor of love, Carol Prohensky. Thank you very much for the great questions about a topic that was very much in the news today. The speeches, Norman, again, you had great use of gestures, which I hadn't really seen before. So today was your day. And David Carr, no video. Oh, well, still with your storytellers, you still gave great information. I love the comment again by Jim Barber, suggesting that you use images, especially try to fit maybe an image of the story. What's your story? Or something like that. You can put up one little graphic with those words on it. 
overall meeting, again, when you're not speaking, particularly, I would say, during the speaker's time, it might help to mute your audio, although today we got a glimpse at a great laugh, so it, there was something to that. And I would like to say that I caught a couple of times Norman drinking water for more than 10 seconds. I was counting, I'm sorry. And Carol, sick and you were blowing your nose and when you watch the replay, you will see that you constantly were, I was looking at you instead of listening. So just be a little careful of that. And I would also just say in closing that under general evaluator, it says that I was just to give an overall view of the meeting. So that was my misunderstanding that you actually had me introduce everyone. And I'll make sure that I adhere to that next time because I did not make note of some of the changes, even though I printed the agenda. So I, I think everybody can benefit more when your general evaluator knows who's up. That said, I was pleased to be your general evaluator of the day. Look forward to doing it again. Back to you, Mr. Toastmaster, Miss Toastmaster of the day, Madam Toastmaster. Thank you, Sonny. You did a great job. Fantastic. And we're at the end of the meeting. I know we have a couple of guests. Veronica, you're a guest? Okay. If you would like to tell us a little bit about yourself really quick and how you found us, maybe. And you're on mute, so. Veronica Adams Cooper here in Albany, Georgia. We're beginning an online club, number 704-9058. I looked online to see who we could reach out to to help us with this endeavor, and I found online presenters, and I reached out to David Carr, and he was so gracious in taking my call that Friday, I think it was that Friday, and he encouraged me he gave us tips, and we're hopeful that we're going to be able to charter sometime in October. I enjoyed today's meeting. I listened to the speeches and how you operate, and we have quite a few things to implement into our club environment. So thank you for having me today. Thank you very much, Veronica. Um, you. Next, I think maybe Gloria. You mean Glenda? Are you Glenda? Oh, uh, Glenda okay. didn't know who Glenda, Glenda is. Okay, I'm sorry. I wrote it down wrong. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, this is Glenda. Um, I, I'm here because, I've, like I said before, I've been doing Toastmasters for 20 years and never finished anything. I would like to finish something. And this doing it online seems to be a way to finish it. I just want to finish it instead of going usually I, my last club was on sunday do you have to drive to a club etc so just doing it at home um you know just doing it at home seems to be advantageous so that's the reason i'm here and thank you thank you guys thank you we look forward to hearing from you in your speeches okay. next up may be stacy if you could tell us a little bit about yourself before you found uh, So this is my second time coming to coming here. Is so I have really really enjoyed it. As I said, um, I was looking for a group. I've been wanting to join Toastmasters for a while, and um, was really excited when I found out that they had an online group. And I was considering doing an online um, uh, doing a Toastmasters, but I want to be a part of the community and learn and. I do videos, I have books, and so I really needed to be a part of a, want to be a part of a community. Okay. We would love to have you. Yeah, Thank great. You. Mm -hmm. uh, Stacy, if you haven't been in Toastmasters before, the only extra hurdle is you'll, you'll have to give a, a table topic speech, basically, about why you want to join the club. That's okay. uh, what we require for people who don't have six Toastmasters speeches. Okay. That's, I guess let me know or uh, yeah, you're, you're welcome to come back next time and do that. We didn't build in time for it this time, but okay, we'd love to have mm -hmm. you. All right, I'll be in the heaven next Monday. <laughs> okay, 
Thank you. Great. Jane, did you, you want to say something Stacey. too? And last, but by no means least, Jane. Oh. Yep. Is, was there a question that went with that? Because I probably lost it. No, we we're just asking you for your feedback on the meeting. Sure. Um, um, <laughs> I have to correct my ums now. I realize there's an <laughs> yes. there <was. laughs> I love that. Well, I think it's, it feels odd because I spend so much time online working and I do whatever I can to not be online, but I, I guess it's a small sacrifice. I just to be part of the TM community. I think it's interesting how you guys have extra roles to accommodate for that, like looking at the back, the, the, the background. All of these things are very important because I recently started creating these how to tutorials for my clients, like how to grow Instagram followers, how to be more active, how to post on Canva, and nobody's evaluating those. <laughs> so I'm just gonna, I, if I, I do plan to, I do wanna join, I already told Lois that I wanna join. I'll be sharing some of that with you guys and uh, find ways to, to transfer my energy, because I'm very energetic on, on, on stage. So I'm gonna have to find ways to do that here. I look forward to that. Um, to getting to know all of them. Thank you, Jane. Thanks. We look forward to it. And now I'm going to turn the meeting back over to Jimmy Dent, our president. Okay, thank you. I want to uh, thank all our guests tonight and hope to see you all back. You're all welcome to come back and look forward to Stacy joining the club. Glad she's interested in everybody else. And uh, and Jane. And Jane, Jane where's yeah, there she is, yes. Yeah, Jane too. Yes, I'm always surprised with this club. We always have one or two guests every meeting mm -hmm. versus some other online clubs. It's uh, We're very popular, we're doing something right. Uh, it was a great meeting tonight. I've got nothing to add. We do have, David, do you have any more information about contest coming up? Well, I can announce that, guess who's going to be our contest master? Carol, can you guess who's going to be our contest master? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I'm so excited. I'm going to be your contest master. So this time, that means I'm not competing. I am ready to host an excellent contest. Don't you want to participate too? Don't you want to win? So how do you win? <laughs> you sign up. Yes, you sign up. And if you are saying, I am not ready for that, I need helpers. I'd love to have you help. So please sign up for that too. Join us September 24th. Mm -hmm. Back to you, Mr. President. Okay, just writing that down. Okay, that's all I have. Anybody have any special announcements at the end of the meeting here? I, I guess I should mention I'm the test, not the test master, the treasurer of the test masters club this year. And so I'm the person who's supposed to nag people about renewing your dues before the end of September. Mm -hmm. So just like there's a join page on our site, there's a renew page on our site. I can send out another reminder. A bunch of people have already signed up. And actually those of you who are officers, you can skip a step by just going to toastmasters.org and paying there through Club Central. But uh, otherwise, pay through me, and I will pay Toastmasters International. Thank you. OK, good night, everybody. Good night. Great meeting. Good night. And, um, good night. Everybody have a happy Labor Day. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>